hello again or for the first time is the case may be um, I've had a lot of requests and for a video about the nature of ideology and the left-right paradigm and honestly it's been one that I've been trying really hard to work out um, it's not so much that the ideas are not complete as much as really articulating them in the most effective means is tricky um, so first I'm going to start off by saying hello to all new subscribers. Thank you for clicking that little red button. Um, and that goes for everyone who chooses to do so from here. Um, as well as everyone who's been subscribed and everyone who's shared the videos and everyone who's continued insisting I make more, which is probably the best reason to do so. Um, so to get right to it, we are increasingly confronted in this world of ours with um, ideology at seemingly all turns it's in some ways is almost sort of replacing religion uh, as the sort of go-to prepackaged off-the-shelf answer to everything mantra or philosophy that people can adopt you know, rather than simply saying God did it now they sort of defer to their ideology chosen or adopted to derive any answers to any questions they may come across, be presented with, or ask themselves. This is really the crux of the thing, however. Ideology was really first described to me in the way that I consider it these days, in one of my first political science classes. A man named Peter Lawler, uh, uh, author, pretty sure he's not a practicing attorney, but um, it, a holder of a JD and he's taught political science uh, throughout the country I believe um, I'll put a link at, um, a link to his book below should anyone be interested in learning more of his thoughts but in one of the very first classes I had with Mr. Olala he asked the class the question what is an ideology and a few hands went up here and there um, offering answers like uh, it's uh, how someone thinks about politics or it's uh, what makes someone a Republican or a Democrat or conservative or a liberal and to an extent within you know to, to a certain respect all of these were pretty pretty on the ball um, but the way he described it following the, their offerings stuck with me and sticks with me to this day an ideology is not really a comprehensive series of positions and answers uh, to questions and issues adopted from thought, but rather it's more like a, a web or a, a nexus of ideas and positions that are adopted for the central purpose of supporting a general overarching and oftentimes emotional um, way of thinking or philosophy or approach to matters. Now you can see this very evidently in some of the more popular uh, fringe ideologies that have cropped up over time. Um, Ultra-orthodox conservatism of the neoconservative or the quasi-anarchistic libertarian variety, or alternately the um, presence of the modern social justice warrior and feminist. Now you can observe the way ideology affects their thinking simply by observing how it is they approach issues. Everything is first filtered through the question, is this position that I'm adopting or promoting a conservative or libertarian or liberal or progressive or feminist idea? This is really the crux of the thing, because what ideology ultimately serves as is a shortcut between an individual asking a question and obtaining an answer, which sort of bypasses all critical thinking, all rational consideration of a thing. There's no need to think too deeply on the question or to ask oneself what different sides and perspectives one could view the thing through, because there's simply already that emotional or philosophical base plate, the ideological base plate from which they can build off of. When you consider it this way, let's take a look at the more popular notions of what ideology means to people and the ways in which it's described or how it sort of fits into politics and political and social thinking. We typically understand or are made to understand that there is a left and a right 
that on the right wing you have generally conservatives and on the left you have liberals and progressives and so you have these two basic blocks of left and right and those who fail to adequately and definitively fall into one of these camps are usually just either written off as centrist or given sort of a subcategory to describe them and this is where it gets interesting from beneath this left and right more basic sort of description you have these individual little factions within them on the right for instance as we said you have the semi-anarchistic libertarians those who basically oppose government and public institutions uh, who are staunch individualists uh, oppose collective notions as well as on the right beside them you also have what's also regarded as neoconservatives um, usually very staunch nationalists opposed to things like public welfare but very much in favor of corporate welfare or you know especially in regards to things such as uh, military power they're ardent nationalists who are often described as imperialists then you also have the religious fundamentalist right who believe that all morality <coughs> all thought, all positions, everything needs to come from their religious doctrine. On the left you have a very similar sort of factional breakdown as to what could make one a leftist in the eyes of the general and reductive public. Uh, feminism is one which is increasingly popular or at least more and more spoken of. Um, it is a leftist progressive ideology which curiously though in practice depending on one's specific adaption of it or adoption of it and practice of it um, also can uh, can often strike to promoting notions and policies and positions on things that one could almost call puritanical those which would almost in some way align with religious fundamentalists but additionally you have uh, environmentalists who make the protection of the environment and the ecology their, their central core tenant around which all other issues become peripheral. Um, then there are socialists, uh, social democrats, you name it. So now we understand that within the left and right, or beneath or within them, there are individual factions, which sort of team up to make up the general notion of what left and right really mean. Now. In addition to these, and stemming from them, are even more sub-factions. You have radical feminists, you have radical environmentalists, you have uh, ultra-orthodox nationalists and America firster types. Um, you have true dyed-in-the-wool anarchists who believe in no government, who believe in no <laughs> public or collective orchestration of society of any kind. And yet the more you break these down, the more you find that the comprehensive totality of positions of those who have adopted these uh, labels, these ideologies, wholesale. When you take a look at the totality of their positions on matters, it does kind of become more and more difficult, oftentimes, to determine whether or not one is classified on the left or the right. Now, as you keep breaking down these factions, the raw numbers of people who make them up continue to shrink from left and right, which is generally meant to more or less sort of describe everyone, well, everyone with an active and engaged political opinion that is more mainstream, even down through those factions themselves, the factions beneath them which make up the totality of that first body, are themselves smaller in number as they are more specified. Therefore, that dictates that the numbers of people who are classified specifically as such, or who self-identify as such, will likewise shrink. So let's keep whittling this down further and further and further. At a certain point, you come to individuals, individual human beings. Now we all know that there are zealots and orthodox absolutists of all stripes who do routinely filter all thought and all policy thinking and all social thinking in general through the lenses of their ideological uh, devoted sort of loyalties or their absolutes. If something doesn't fall within the paradigm that they've adopted, they're either ignored or uh, derided or just written off as nonsense externalities that mean nothing compared to the central tenets of the ideology that they seek to promote. But let's forget about those extremists for a moment. Let's take the average person. Now, it may seem 
It may be a stretch in the eyes of some to say that the average person is, or at least has the potential to be, completely rational. If you approach them in a civil and open and honest fashion, present them with solid evidence and data, they'll come to rather comprehensive or complex conclusions of their own if given enough time and space and inspiration to think on them. Their conclusions may be wildly different from others, but to themselves, using the logic and ideas that they have, the positions that they come to on those single issues, irrelevant of broader ideological contexts, can themselves generally be rather rational, well thought out, and they'll have reasons and explanations for them. Likewise, if they're open-minded enough, and this is again perhaps a bit of a stretch to say it applies to most people, but I'd like to think so, but a rational, open-minded person when presented with evidence which would, um, which would basically rebuff or uh, argue against the conclusions that they've come to, if that evidence is strong enough, then this rational, open-minded person should adopt a new position, or at least rethink the one that they've come to. So how does this filter back up into these broader ideological contexts? Well, politics, as everyone knows, is largely a numbers game. Individuals need to be grouped into masses. They are grouped into these masses largely by convincing them of certain things posed as truths, which themselves have levels of honesty and truthfulness and validity in varying levels depending on where they're coming from, how the evidence is presented, how the data is sort of filtered to lead to these conclusions. So take that individual you can have a rational conversation with. You approach them, they approach you. Both of you have a rather well-rounded set of b positions, beliefs, and ideas that you've hold, held on to. And on the ones that you agree upon, that draws you together. So a majority of your ideas are compatible with one another. The disagreements you have are either going to be set aside in in favor of promoting the broader spectrum of ideas that you both agree on, or they'll just perhaps be argued and debated elsewhere at other times when not engaging on those that you agree on, and this can either be for personal refinement between the two of you or just for fun. Some people like to argue. So you have two people, good amount of issues that they agree upon, they sort of form a band, a pair between them, an alliance if you will, to promote these given ideas they agree on, and the disagreements are set aside, put aside, for another time, or to hash out at a different time. Now you add a third person into this mix. Now this third person has a good deal of those same positions that those first two, yourself and the other individual, agree on, and then the sort of Venn diagram begins to come together, in which the overlap of your given positions defines you as an alliance, or a unit of allied supporters, however you want to describe it. However, as they approach the two of you, the disagreements that the two of you, both together and individually, can have with this third party, well, in an effort to support those which you still altogether support, those disagreements are also put aside, but the numbers of them perhaps broadens. This pattern continues the more people who are brought together, and this is the trickling up from the individual to the broader ideological context. Every time more people come in to the, let's call it a party in this sense, the numbers of disagreements between them on given issues grows. And likewise, the centralization of agreements that bind you become more and more condensed to a certain point, and at a certain point then as well, these agreements which bind you, well, they also have to become more general, more nebulous, too much specificity, and individuals or factions which develop within this group will dissent, diverge, and then the unity with which your political strength is, from which your political strength is derived begins to erode. So, the broader and broader you get, the more general and general the agreements get, until you reach points in which your faction, your team, your party, is large enough to where, rather than necessary specifics that people gravitate towards, it's the general philosophy or 
ideology in this case, which is really the attractive and unifying factor. Now, how does this feed into what we see now? Looking at factions as they are, looking at parties, and looking at ideologies both broadly and smaller, on smaller factional levels, it's pretty easy to notice that the central agreements that bind these factions together often become highly supercharged, leading to fringe thinking, orthodoxies, radicalism. Well, how is it that this occurs? Well, competition, naturally. One thing that many people have observed, and that seems to be very true, is that, an that to an increasing degree in respect to what is left, or what is right, what is conservative, what is liberal, is oftentimes itself a central point of debate. It is not just a point of debate because individual in individuals and the factions that they may belong to want to have a broader amount of power and control within the broader ideological body that they exist in, but also because, to a great extent, many who find themselves attracted to ideologies, who themselves in their busy daily lives maybe don't have the time to sit and thoroughly think through every question or issue or policy that they may encounter, to such a degree as to come to well-rounded understandings. What they find in is that they're presented with a series of options, things that they can be left, right, center, libertarian, socialist, anarchist, etc., etc., etc. And what they oftentimes do is they find themselves gravitating towards one not out of attraction to it as much as repulsion by the other. This is again where this general underlying philosophy bit comes in. As they approach these questions and they observe the rhetoric and by extension the oftentimes emotionally based ways of thinking and philosophy that lead into and feed these ways of thought and action, they find that some are simply so repugnant to them for various levels and for various, in various ways and for various reasons that the antithesis of them seems just too good to not lend their voice and their power to, to sort of submit their agency, not in support of a given idea necessarily, but in opposition to it. You see this quite often, especially within the more orthodox, mainstream, progressive, and conservative circles. The definition and disgust with um, what c their opposition is, at least either in their eyes or by their opposition's own admission, become what they define their political standing on. It is not so much I support X, so much as I oppose Y. Now over history, as the battle for broader political narratives, especially by operatives within parties and ideological factions, continue to sort of redefine the rhetoric that gets flung back and forth, notions about what one hates become almost as strong as what one loves. Now, in their opposition to this, as they become further ingrained within their faction and by extension the broader ideology that it falls under, they themselves will oftentimes become supercharged with the rhetoric, which is, in many cases, exactly what it's defined to do. It's not hard to look at an ideological or partisan pissing match, and when one steps back and views it objectively to see the whole mess is nothing more than a bunch of reductionist inane bullshit, using buzzwords and emotional ploys and hooks in order to maintain loyalty and the lockstep unity on their own side, while trying to deride and decry the other as being hateful, uh, misogynistic, racist, sexist, or uh, communist, collectivist, you want to steal my money, you want to come and take my guns, etc., etc. Lots of fear-mongering, lots of emotional ploys, lots of outrage. When you come down to it, though, and once you look past all the bullshit and you take the time to actually think about things, even if you're trying to challenge your own ideas, which is something that every sound intellectual mind really needs to do, one often finds that, much as it was discussed in a previous video, every bit of speech contains in it some kind of logical truth, even if the end result of that logic doesn't actually lead to a commonly accepted or beneficial or even correct assertion, the initial strand of logic, of thinking, which led down that path, to some degree has some validity to it. Once this is recognized, 
even if the initial position that opposes it is maintained, a more refined understanding both of the opposition as well as the position adopted evolves within the mind of whoever is doing the thinking. This is the importance again of argument, debate, and dissent. Without these things, ideas are never really cultured. They're never properly distilled. When ideas are not properly distilled, when they're not thought through and ground out into a really comprehensive understanding of the issue being tackled, the reductionist sort of reaction that lends one to sort of adopting these positions is the same exact mechanism which allows them to fall into ideological purity. Once they've done that, much like with religion or any real philosophy, the supercharging of these underlying ideas not only serves to really seal the deal in terms of their loyalty and their absolutism in respect to their adopted ideology, etc., but also turns them into a weapon. And this is where things get dangerous. This is why, rather than opponents, we hear talk of enemies. This is why, rather than arguments, we hear fights. Whether or not there are final, absolute, objective truths to every question is difficult to answer on its own. Subjectivity is something that every person lives with. And whether they're a deep and an engaged thinker, speaker, researcher, or just the coffee shop armchair revolutionary, or even just somebody who catches bits in the news in passing and draws somewhat of some, some some variant of opinion and position on them from just little sound bites that they hear. Everyone is prone to subjectivity. But it is in recognizing that and the consistent recognizing that you could be wrong and that you could have been manipulated that one can maintain a sound intellectual footing when it comes to approaching broader matters of social and political realities. It is important not to be weaponized, as that is itself a form of manipulation. And it is also important to realize that the absolutists, those who dedicate themselves solely to the promotion of given ideologies, oftentimes become operatives or manipulators in the process. And before I go, I'm going to leave you with this. There's a concept I've been fond of batting around. I can't say I'm going to take full credit for the articulation of it, as I'm sure it's been said before, but within the areas of politics, social thinking, within these social sciences, which as we are increasingly seeing are very easily co-opted for more agenda-driven efforts and aims, there's a thing I like to call the con man's asset in constant play. One thing that any good con man and this goes for salespeople and political people as well. One asset that they can always rely on while attempting to manipulate individuals or groups is the fact that individuals and groups, especially once they've bought a line, will fight to the death to defend it. Not even necessarily because they believe, but because the notion that they could have been manipulated is so terrifying and so offensive that they will defend themselves against the notion at any cost. So, once again, thank you for stopping by. Please share the video, subscribe, offer your thoughts. As always, I will never turn them down. And uh, with the sound of that water heater, I bid you good night. <laughs>